<laughs> okay, I will call this work session to order. This is governance. We'll discuss, discuss about potential committee restructuring. There are a few things I wanna be able to accomplish this evening. First, be done by nine o'clock. Okay. okay, second, second, we will hear the feedback from each school board member liaison to advisory committee first. It's just a hearing the feedback, sharing the feedback. We're not discussing it. We're not even asking questions unless it is a clarifying question. So sharing the feedback. And then I will give an opportunity to Dr. Garza to present the options she has explored and they share with the board members. And we'll have a, some discussion, hopefully by the end of this evening, we'll come with something to take back to respective advisory committees for further feedback. If you look at the timeline, we did adopt back in January, we gave ourselves pretty generous timeline for many opportunities to have a discussion on this very important topic. If you look at it, March, each board liaison discussed with his or her respective advisory committee about the potential restructuring of the advisory committees. That's in March. In April, board liaison share feedback, further feedback received from advisory committees. And May, we reach a tentative agreement and then put it as a new business interaction item during the month of June. So we're not gonna do all the work tonight, folks. We'll just end at nine o'clock, so cooperate with me. Okay, with that, I am gonna go by, I have a list. I have a list of advisory committees with the uh, school board member liaison. Uh, I'm gonna put my name last, even though it's at the top. I'll start with AAP, Corvus Sanders. I'm sorry, I think Mrs. McLachlan made a request to go first. So I'm gonna have Mrs. McLachlan go first. Uh, no, I just mentioned I've got a carpool to pick up um, some kids from swim practice. So um, I wanted to just share from the Minority Student um, Achievement um, Oversight Committee that uh, primarily their concerns is just uh, size. Uh, when you look at um, these advisory committees, um, we know as board members it's tough to get 12 points of view shared. And uh, while it's so much appreciated to have as many stakeholders as we can, we have to start thinking about the functionality of these advisory committees. And so I think that was one of their most important things for us to consider is um, at what point do you when do you hit the tipping point of where it's unwieldy, number one? And then number two, I think that uh, they would probably uh, like to see uh, the a, a better understanding of how to make their annual reports uh, more worthwhile, you know, that they, they work very hard on these reports and then uh, they, they work alongside FCPS staff for the year. Uh, and so the goal would hopefully be that through that interface, um, instead of the clunky approach we have now, which is they present in June, then staff gives a response, and then sometime in the fall, it, they're in the midst of trying to do their work again. So one option would be that as the staff is working with them throughout the course of the year, if there's a committee report recommendation and then staff who's been working with them all year has a minority report or you know uh, opinion that they want the board to understand and take into context here's their recommendation here's some of the caveats and concerns from staff it's all right there um, and then I think that they would welcome something like we're seeing in the proposal where maybe we're doing one of these one not having them done within two weeks at the end of you know late may early june and so uh it's suddenly a crash course now we would need to think about since we try and start on a calendar year or the school calendar year 
if we're doing them on a monthly rotating basis, how does that work with our appointments? So, you know, so anyway, I just, I think that uh, it'll be very interesting to see what the other committees think, but those were the key points they shared with me. Thank you, Mrs. McLaughlin. Now, let me go to AAP, Corvus Anders. Thank you. Um, in speaking to the chair and vice chair or co-chair of the Advanced Academic Programs Advisory Committee, uh, they actually welcomed a, you know, a review of all of our advisory committees. They feel that it is a critical piece of our governance process to have an advise have advisory committees in key areas, um, but they really feel strongly that it has when we task our advisory committees that we need to task them with real and meaningful work that um, takes advantage of the expertise and experience in the community that they bring to the table. Uh, they also, similar to what you've heard from uh, my colleague, Ms. McLaughlin, is they feel that the feedback mechanism might be more appropriate, you know, a better feedback mechanism, uh, more deliberative, uh, so that if there are recommendations that um, rather than just a, a response back, it's over time, have we actually accomplished some of those recommendations? Um, and they believe that the advisory committees actually play a really important role in being a voice for the community um, and a role of um, adding additional transparency. Okay, thank you. I'll go to CTE with uh, Mr. Wilson. Uh, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to report from the CTE, although I did meet. Um, with the, uh, uh, the committee chair and uh, what was expressed to me was that the, the productivity of the CTE is sort of in evolution. Uh, the meeting I attended, um, uh, to be honest with you, I still was sort of gathering sort of information about what they're doing in the CTA, the CTE context and it was more of an introductory meeting for me. Uh, so unfortunately I can't give a comprehensive report at this point. Okay, thank you. I have uh, FPAC, Sandy Evans. FPAC's a little bit of a different animal, but um, they're generally, uh, they're, they're pleased with their um, structure and willing to take on meaty topics for us. Um, they did point out that, that uh, unlike most of our advisory committees, um, they, they don't get an official staff response. Um, which may or may not be, be an issue, but they didn't point that out. Um, I think they were interested in some clarity on how we might move forward with their recommendations. We just had a, we began a conversation at CPDC over what CPDC's role is and should be vis-a-vis um, -vis FPAC. And, you know, um, as I say, we just started that conversation, but, you know, one possibility would be for CPDC to take their recommendations and uh, proactively either, you know, move them forward or not move them forward. Of course, any board member could still, you know, choose to, to move forward something that we didn't. But, you know, that was one idea. One, um, uh, on, on the other end of the scale, we could be um, something else entirely and, and um, only come forward when when there was a uh, you know a need to vet a, a new FPAC member because again they they're different uh, uh, their structure is different but that's about as far as we've gotten we're gonna, CPDC is going to continue having that conversation in a few weeks. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I have a FISAP, Delia Pelcher. So FISAP is also a little bit different in that um, they are required. Um, so some of the things they do, their structure um, is not flexible. Um, and they will come back with additional um, recommendations, but initially I think the cycle of having the staff there and then sending the recommendations to us to then be responded to by the staff that has been there all along um, to work through the process, you know, is something that we can look at. Um, can there just be more direct collaboration between them and the staff as they're working through the process, the recommendations, um, rather than having it come to the board back to the staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, students with disabilities. I'm sorry, am I jumping? Okay, human relations. Hey. 
So I did have a chance to get introduced to the committee and the chair uh, and I were able to sit down. So some of the things that they feel like are positive, it sounds like it has a lot of veterans in the group and he feels like it's a good mix of veterans and new members so that, you know, they have a lot of consistency, but then they also have new ideas coming. Uh, one of the biggest concerns they have is it sounds like we have a policy that we say which organizations they reach out to to get um, to get advisors to the committee. And I guess for four or five years, there are certain organizations on the list that have never had anyone show up. So one suggestion would be to make sure we are reviewing the organizations we're reaching out to and maybe update those from the different um, community groups we're trying to reach on that committee. Um, that was the main thing. And yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have should on health. Uh, so the SHAC committee, um, so they've been very involved with policy work this year and they had some specific recommendations. Um, they like the, the ability to be able to give some real policy advice to the board as, as we work through that. Um, they like being able to have staff and citizens working together for this final product. Um, there is some concern from the, that the officers have the possibility of possibly having a two-year term since it seems like the, some of the turnaround slows down um, a long-term project. So that was brought up. Um, and the ability or maybe making it easier to have subcommittees that focus on specific projects. I know some committees have that. And um, and they also mentioned having the ability to have some input on the type of um, appointees and the types of community connections that um, that they are looking for that we look for when we appoint committee members. So you know it would be helpful to have you know someone with legal background, business background, specific ties to our local business or nonprofit community, so that we can so the committee can be very connected and diverse in. Um, the connections and representation that they offer. Okay, thank you. I have uh, students with disabilities. Mr. Schwartz. Sir, I'm, I mean, if you notice the bottom of the paper, I'm, we're one of the legally required, so we don't really get to, you know, um, get away with anything other than, you know, we're legally required to have this. Um, and we're working on, or they're working on um, a second year of the same charge with um, executive function piloting. Um, I think it's probably one of our ho most highly functioning committees um, just because people are deeply vested and we have um, some members who've been on for many, many years. So there's a lot of continuity um, and they are very highly structured um, in terms of the way the committees are run. In fact, I'd recommend if anybody ha finds um, difficulties with meetings running smoothly with any of your um, committees, have one or two of your committee members come and watch an ACSD meeting. Um, the, the way it's, it's run from the outset and their feedback is phenomenal and they break up into the subcommittees and write their reports um, extremely well, extremely well. So I don't, you know, there's nothing really we can do in terms of improving it because it's really, really good. Okay, thank you. Uh, title one, Jeanette Huff. Uh, so I also got my uh, crash course on this committee and they were uh, really helpful in understanding what they're working on and uh, things that are working well for them. Uh, so one of their main maybe suggestions was that if we as a board were giving them a clear charge and better feedback on the recommendations that they give. Are they too specific? Are they not specific enough? And they actually were showing me their recommendations from last year, and the recommendation itself seemed very general. When I asked them about it, they they kind of chuckled because it, in some senses, it was a very obvious recommendation. And but in other senses, it sounds like there was a lot of back work to that recommendation that could have maybe. Um, been more informative if there'd been some specifics to it. And and this was something I'd sort of heard in both of the committees I visited was that 
they're not really quite sure what happens to the recommendations. And and my sense was that maybe it's because we we are maybe we're not giving feedback that they need to say this recommendation's helpful or or not helpful. And then also the charge in itself maybe needs to be a little bit clearer and better understanding for them of the expectation and outcomes uh, that we would like to see. A um, couple of I actually got to. Uh, listen to a guest speaker they had that was really encouraging and it's great work on how they can engage um, community and family members of uh, communities that maybe usually feel isolated and it was really encouraging it was I thought I was seeing some really great work and they're doing things like sharing ideas among their schools of things that are working well. And so it seems to me, it's also another required one, but it seemed like they were doing some really good work. Okay, I, I'm the board liaison to ACE, Adult and Community Education. Their overall feedback back to me was they wanna be able to maintain exact same relationship with us. They seem to believe that uh, their constituents are very unique they are not K through 12, but they are grown-ups. They do not have a usual normal tie, unlike other K through 12 students where parents have a connection with a school board members, and they, they believe that they are the ones who are the voice of these constituents they are serving. Okay, all the feedback's done with. Now we'll go to Dr. Garza to present her research. Could I ask a clarifying question okay. first? Um, just process-wise, I'm a little concerned because um, this is really ambitious and it's good work, and I think it's great if Dr. Garza wants to, you know, begin with the the options and the information she gathered. But I just want to understand, Mr. Moon, um, we canceled our retreat on Saturday, and we're really only going to have maybe 10, 15 minutes at most for the board after Dr. Garza presents, if that. So since I'm going to leave, could you just clarify when the board as a whole is going to talk about um, both these parts? Because this is, these are both ambitious pieces of work. And Okay, we are, we are going to have a preliminary discussion tonight and see. I mean, I'm going to have to wait and see where the discussion goes because I, I cannot prejudge what the board members may, be, may, may say that our... A, you know, meat of the discussion on these potential changes will not come until May time frame. Tonight, I want to be, a, what I'm trying to accomplish tonight is hear from Dr. Garza on options that we can consider. And we talk about that and hopefully just decide upon what do you want to take back to advisory committees to get their feedback on some of the options the board Bolt will be considering, and then we have a discussion of that in May, so April and May time frame. Okay, so, but there's, see, there's two things we're trying to tackle here. So if Dr. Garza is going to speak to our our standing advisory committee, I mean, our our school board advisory committees, that's a big thing to tackle all by itself. The school board standing committees is just board conversation by itself, absolutely, absolutely. and I don't see how both those get done tonight. So let's wait until what you know, Dr. Gaza has brought to us because her options include both advisory committees and the standing committees. And let's see what she has to say. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Moon. I, I want to remind the, the school board about why this even came up. Uh, one of your former colleagues um, actually at a forum asked for the governance committee to look at this. If y'all recall, it's been a while back. And I think it was precipitated by some of the same things that you all, uh, I think, continued to hear expressed by um, the advisory committee membership. Um, so we were asked to kind of see what everybody else is doing, and you, you saw those listed. I will tell you, it's all over the map. You probably noticed that. There, there are no real um, common themes in terms of what other school systems are doing. Um, so I think once you look at this, and it was also – difficult to ascertain for some of them what was the difference between advisory committees and board standing committees. They're doing all manner of 
structures and they've in some cases in many cases they've changed them numerous times so i think the the lesson learned from this is they need to be designed to meet the needs of fairfax county <laughs> everyone has their own own design uh, so i hope that's helpful to you all we tried to collect information we thought you, you might find useful um you know we just took a leap here we're not suggesting we have any preference over any one of these just as some something to as a talking as a starting point certainly always the option is do nothing um, option two uh, i think there was also an interest of if we make some changes why not align these around our strategic um, goals i mean we, we we would love to have some more input in kind of a working fashion around the strategic goals um, and we could see an option two where you could align some of the existing committees around the four board, the four strategic planning goals. That's a wholesale change. This one's pretty significant. Um, so you may not have, you know, the stomach for that kind of change or significant change. And there may be a variation of this that you might like uh, the board. Um, and that is a contemplation of, you know, kind of reducing our committees getting them involved around strategic goal areas. Maybe they would feel like they had more influence over the system uh, in that way. Option three, um, because I have, like many of the board members, and I think some of you expressed it from your committees tonight, and our new school board members, you haven't experienced this unless you've been one of these committees, but what we do is we take all of these committees and they present their reports over three consecutive nights, four, four uh, reports a night, and I, I think they feel like we don't give them sufficient time. Um, and I think that was brought up by a number of you. So we're suggesting maybe as an option three, you would keep all your standing committees the same. Uh, I'm talking about board standing committees. And then the advisory committees, you would keep the same, but just spread them out over a year. And I think the way you would do that then is we would schedule them and some of them would have, have more than a year the first year just to get us going. And I think that then, uh, if you're interested in that kind of model, we could kind of create some models for that. Then we'd have more substantive time with the committees. And I think there would be more substantive opportunity for, you know, how is this impacting our work? So um, we're, we're happy to do, Steve is very helpful, as is Marty on this work. So if there's anything else that we could research or maybe some other models you want us to create or contemplate, we're happy to help. Okay, I, I have a th so far three board members, but before I go to uh, Corbett Sanders, let me ask Dr. Garza a clarifying question. On, uh, under option two, when you say maintain required advisory committees, only those required by law, you know, earlier some of the board liaisons mentioned about their advisory committee, their advisory committees being legally required. Uh, but I think there's a distinction between a legally required advisory committees for the school board versus legally required committees for the school system, i.e., uh, I believe the CTEAC, Korea Technical Education Committee, is legally required for the school board, and, and students with a disability, AC, ACSD, is also legally required for school board to have as its advisory committee. But I think the Title I, and they are required for the school system, so they could be they could be reporting, they could be interacting with the staff as opposed to school board. So that's my interpretation. Uh, if I'm wrong, just let me know. So when you say maintain required advisory committees, uh, did you mean to say all those four committees? Okay, thank you. With that, let me go to. Corbett Sanders to be followed by Strauss and McLaughlin. Well, if I'm Mrs. McLaughlin, if you have to go, you want to go first? People don't mind. I probably should be okay. leaving in Please. three minutes, which is great for my colleagues because they'll have to be fast. Um, Dr. Garza, I appreciate, since I serve on governance, um, you helping us look at what the other surrounding jurisdictions have. Um, I just want my colleagues to know that I really do see these as two um, different major pieces of work. Um, I think that uh, we have to be mindful of the fact that we did cancel the retreat this coming Saturday. And I really do believe when it comes to the school board's 
standing committees, the board work we do is going to require some really robust conversation about how we believe um, we can wrestle with the major work that we do and what what is the value and what do subcommittees um, then contribute to the work we do. And I, I don't feel like tonight is going to get us there. So my advocacy would be at minimum you task this back to governance to start fleshing out what Dr. Garza has listed here. And then um, we're going to really need to, I believe, have another work session before May to really allow you guys to kind of digest what Dr. Garza's had here and, and maybe some of the things. That's, that's for the standing committee piece. Um, for the advisory committee piece, I will just tell you that I think it's essential that we capitalize on the million people who live in this county who are subject matter experts to advise us who don't have the time nor the individual staff that serve on the school board office to help us do this great work. Um, so while I appreciate Dr. Garza recommending that perhaps that staff works with them and we get a report back, I think we need to remember that we rely on these advisory committees because we don't have staff and we don't have analysts and we don't have people who can help us do the board type work. So I welcome the opportunity again through governance and also talking with our committees, how do we make them more effective? Um, because I think that's the biggest piece that they are saying it's a big time commitment on their part and they want to know they serve a value. And I do think that through governance, we can work with Dr. Garza in identifying ways to maximize and be more efficient with staff investment of time. I think staff spend a lot of time with our advisory committees and maybe we can figure out a way to streamline it. Because the advisory committees have told me that staff do a lot of presentations in a meaningful way but as a result, it's just a lot of staff work and then the very people who are there to bring their subject matter expertise actually don't dialogue with each other. So again, that's my preference. I really think that this is only a touching the very beginning of this topic and without the retreat, I really hope you'll all agree that we're gonna need to make sure we put this on, whether it's a Thursday night work session again in March to talk about our standing committees and in terms of the advisory, Mr. Moon, I'm comfortable with that. Now we're going to go back and talk some more with our committees. Um, and, you know, we could do that work again. But I almost think we need to have one work session on school board standing committees and then a, a separate work session conversation about our advisory committees because it's a lot to tackle both at the same time. And I think we want to do justice to both. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank Mr. you. Mr. Moon, if I might clarify, we did, make, we did not make any staff recommendations. We were doing the homework that the governance committee gave to us, but there could be a multitude of er other variations in this, and so there isn't a formal recommendation from us. I understand. Okay. I understand. Okay. With that, I have uh, Ms. Cora Sanders. Um, thank you. I would second that we should parse this out, breaking apart um, the board the board committees versus the advisory committee discussion. And in um, addressing the advisory committee discussion, um, I would like to suggest that maybe we look at a hybrid uh, because I absolutely agree with you, Dr. Garza, that it's important or it would be useful to tie the work of our advisory committees to our strategic plan and that also leverages the um, feedback or addresses the feedback I think we've received from most of the advisory committees, which is that they want real and meaningful engagement. And so um, kind of piggybacking on what Ms. McLaughlin said about the ability of our advisors to actually have a, um, a, a uh, provide some staffing to the uh, individual board members, being able to have the charges for each of the advisory committees more closely aligned with the strategic plan would be wonderful. Okay, Mrs. Rauch, to be followed by Ms. Evans. Um, first of all, I agree that the piece up in the Title I parent advisory committees are their own piece and they have a very different um, uh, operation and goal within what they do each month so that I am not sure that we need to give them a charge actually 
they do excellent work that meets their own particular needs. So um, certainly the charge needs to be tied to our strategic plan. Over the years, we've always tried to tie the charges to whatever the school board overall goal goals were. So we've always tried to do that. In terms of what to do with the remaining citizen advisory committees, um, some of these have been around for a long time and there are a lot of people that who are on the committees that enjoy being on the committees and be, I think culturally in many ways it would be very hard to get rid of them. I think there would be a lot of um, uh, pushback in the community. Um, and some of these committees have over time provided some very meaty um, uh, recommendations to the school board that have resulted in dramatic changes, progress, what have you. Some, maybe not so much, but um, it would be wonderful to have committees around our, specifically our strategic goals, but I am not sure getting rid of the citizen advisory committees to somehow do that. I think we'd get a lot of very sad citizens <laughs> if we took some of these committees away. That would be my only, that would be my concern. Ms. Evans. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to understand option two a little bit better. Um, is is this all one one option, Doctor? Gar is it is is the idea or is this? It's whatever you want it to be. Whatever I want it to be. Okay. All How right. you like that? Okay. This, this is what, a workshop. Okay. Test what we were trying to accomplish yeah. is so. What would an option look like that was aligned to our strategic plan? Because I do think there's some value in, um, in us doing work that we says that we say already is a priority, and I think that the, the folks then that are engaged would also feel like they were adding value. So we tried to take existing committees and try to line those around the, the four goals. Uh, did we do that very well? I'm not sure. Um, that's what we were trying to accomplish, and we were also trying to establish some board stronger board representation around those two that were beyond beyond what's currently in place. For an example, uh, goal one on, on essentially student learning, student success, we don't have really one board committee that's around that right now. Right. Uh, many school systems you saw have a curriculum and instruction committee, and we don't have anything kind of comparable. So we kind of saw some value in that, but at the same time, you can't just add a lot more committees. You have to... If, if you're going to add new ones, you have to take something away. You know, we couldn't have mat couldn't manage it. So I apologize. It's probably not as clear as what we <laughs> what we meant it to be, but we were trying to kind of do a couple of things. And that is board representation mm -hmm. with some community um, expertise and and input around the four strategic goals uh, in the in the school system. So primarily. that's your third bullet there. That that would. That, that that third bullet would be committees based on the four goals. Yes, be kind of, like the, kind of like the new audit committee where you have board members plus citizens, okay. and it may even be more citizens than that than we have on the audit committee, um, but to have real robust conversations around student success, uh, caring culture, resource allocation, et cetera. And then um, if, if we liked this bullet three, we would still retain audit and governance under this kind of. I, I, I thought you first of all you have to have audit, uh, but governance I thought because it's such a policy directed function that you might want to consider. I, I didn't know whether or not that would set very well within a or one of the four goal areas. Okay. So when Steve and I talked about, it, we thought probably that's going to have to stand alone under that kind of configuration. Okay, but it looks to me like maybe we, if we use bullet one. Audit and governance is standalone. Then we would kind of be choosing between bullet two and bullet three, or is, are these all? What we were trying to do in two is kind of show how c some current committees would be tied into the four one of the four goal areas. Okay. Bullet two is more trying to illustrate. For an example, our current budget would be tied to goal four, mm -hmm. which is resource allocation. Um, public engagement would would be tied to goal two, which is care and culture, where we have a lot of our, our um, communications, outreach, um, strategies, um, activities. And then the comprehensive planning development would also be tied to four, which is resource stewardship, where we talk about facilities and budget and stuff like that. 
And then bullet three would create committees around uh, student achievement and workforce as well, or no? Uh, student achievement, student success, yeah. premier workforce, um, caring culture, and oh. resource stewardship oh, are four major goals. Okay. Um, I think that third. I think that third bullet just kind of gets into some ideas for what the potential makeup of those committees could be. You know, okay. we put that together. Okay. Well, that gives us a lot to ponder. I guess um, uh, I, I will say, just um, having served on Shack as a community member and having served as the liaison, I do think that um, that's a committee that that does very substantive work. Um, so I think that that's one. That is required? Oh, all right. So, so that's... Okay. Okay. Well, well, I think it's, 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 a, it, it's, it's... Okay, we'll just, look into that. We'll look into that. Okay. Make sure so, that yeah. we need to have all the legally um, required committees. So, I guess that my other question then, Mr. Moon, once we've had a chance to um, mull this over, do you want board members to um, give their thoughts to you as governance chair on... Uh, oh, well, let's, let's hear from all board members who want to speak, and then let's decide which way to go. Okay. okay? Uh, I have uh, Mr. Press and Ms. Hines and Mr. Church. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Um, I really appreciate this, this discussion. I think it's very informative. Um, what I would say is I agree with the previous uh, sentiment that was expressed that we should parse this discussion out. I think it is two separate pieces of business. Uh, while they are definitely interrelated, I think it would allow the board to have a more flexible discussion when we're able to, to kind of laser focus on the particular areas that we, we need to discuss. I agree that there are some changes that we could make to our, our citizen advisory committees. I'm not going to comment on the board standing committees because that's not uh, that's not my realm. But uh, being someone that came from, you know, really got my start in school board advocacy on one of these advisory committees, as Ms. Evans expressed, um, I, I agree that they really do substantive, important work. And you know, coming from Shack, that was something that you know I really was immersed in for two years. Um, the value that we get from that, I think, is far too much for us as a board to, to overlook, and, and in my opinion, I think it does a disservice to us in the long term to eliminate many of these. We do, as Ms. McLaughlin uh, expressed, have a great wealth of human capital in this system. You know, we saw it last Thursday when we were able to bring that human capital into the classroom. Uh, we get better outcomes. We were able to bring that human capital into board discussions and recommendations. I think we get better outcomes in our decisions. Um, and I think that that's very important for us to keep in mind as we have uh, we have this discussion. I wanted to comment briefly on the um, issue of board uh, advisory committee reports to the board. Um, I think a written model is is great, and I think having that written model supplemented by a, a, a conversation at one of the board's work sessions towards the end of the year uh, is a, a good model for us to carry forward. I do agree that the way we have it now, though, is a bit crowded. Having four committees report per night or whatever the number works out to be is too much. Having been someone who came out here and, and sat and, you know, we had probably 10 minutes to discuss a, a, a wellness policy that we had proposed that was probably 30 pages long, which didn't do the committee's work justice, in my opinion. So I was just thinking about it, and if, you know, if, if the chair's discretion to schedule work sessions at the end of the year, you know, in future years where we could do you know, just double that, do three three meetings in a row, one week and then another week, whenever that's convenient, to do another three. And instead of doing four per night, do two. That allows more time for an informed discussion. So that was something that popped into my head. But I do certainly think that, um, you know, this discussion, number one, should be parsed out and, and that um, we really should c contemplate the value that each of those advisory committees brings. And certainly, if there's a way that we can improve their efficiency and and you know, how meaningful that they can be to this board if we're evaluating a specific component of our strategic plan and we think that we see a place for them to come in and comment. Absolutely, I think we should capitalize on that and let that influence their charge for the year. But definitely, I, my opinion on this going forward is that we should empower them to report on an annual basis. Um, you know, that's, at least in my experience, that's how long my appointees' terms last. And I don't know if that's the, you know, the policy for, for all board members. Um, but I want, you know, in as a student leader, I want to give them the, the opportunity to come back to this board and share their thoughts. So, um, you know, that's just a few a few things I wanted to throw out there. Thank you, Mr. Press. I have Ms. Hines to be followed by Mr. Schultz and Mr. Anna Koufax. OK, 
Okay, so I might be disagreeing a little bit with the idea that we need to talk about these things totally separately. And I, um, if I understand uh, what staff work is here, looking at option two, it sounds like it was an, yeah, it was an attempt to pull the whole thing together. And I think there actually might be some advantages to that, right? Because um, it is all, kind, you know, if we really are being strategic and aligning all of it to our strategic goals, then maybe I would like to see the governance committee consider um, taking the whole thing on as sort of a, a holistic change in how we do things. Now, um, that said, we do have these um, committees that are used to meeting and they've been around a long time and I think Mrs. Strauss is right. So just going through the ones that we have that I guess are not required, um, because I think if we just say we're going to do away with them, we will get a tremendous amount of pushback because um, they are doing good work. So I'm thinking of where they would fit. Like, I guess um, Shaq would fit in our the caring culture, I guess. I mean, just trying to think of where um, they, could, they could fit in or how we could, could take the same work and kind of the same group of people and fit them into a new way of doing this. Um, so, it, for instance, if we had... A, kind of a caring, I don't know where, if we want to have a caring culture committee, um, but would that include all the, you know, the people in the work of Shaq? I mean, I look at um, a ACE, I'm not sure, you know what I mean? I'm not sure where the existing committees fit. APAC, MSAOC, I think those fit in student success, right? But you've got ACE, HRAC, um, I'm not sure where they fit. So am, am I asking a good question? I'm not even sure. <laughs> First of all, it was my interpret my understanding, if I recall correctly, and I should have brought my governance manual with me, that SHAC is required. But um, what you would do is kind of those that are not required would go away, except representation. Of, there would be people that are currently on a lot of these advisor committees that would then be probably nominated to be on one of these four strategic goal committees. So, I mean, there could be some of the same people, but just aligned to the goals. Right. So then it would change a lot. We'd, we'd have people who are used to serving on a 15 member committee, I guess. And um, they would, they, some of them would no longer serve because we would say we only want six, whatever we say, and they could be selected. In it. But, but maybe we could uh, keep some of the, or all of any of the folks who want to stay. Cause that's the other thing. There are always um, vacancies on these committees as well. Right. You could even consider um, smaller working groups that look more like an audit committee and then have a larger committee that's many more stakeholders. And you would meet maybe every other month with a larger group. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's some many variations of this that maybe are possible is possible. Okay. So I'll just close by saying I would like governance to take a look at this as a, <laughs> not, not separately, but, you know, take advantage of some of the thinking that staff has done and see if we could, you know, realign all of it based on our strategic plan goals. Can Mr. Church? Just quickly, because I, I, you know, I don't know necessarily the work that everybody else is doing, but when I was looking at this earlier, I was wondering, and I would appreciate understanding because I have a newly appointed member to SHAC um, where we are on that. Um, could not, when, when I'm listening as a board member to the reports and how they're dovetailed together and presenting us information, isn't there a way to sort of combine the FESEP Head Start and Title I committees? I, I just, I, there's a lot of overlap. And, and, and it seems, not only is there a lot of overlap, but there's also, um, like a natural progression of if, if the parents are in fee step and head start and if they're advocates, they're naturally going to be, so there's, I don't know. It just seems like there's a marrying of resources mm -hmm. and it's, I, I just felt like couldn't that, that looked to me like a um, streamline and focus, not hocus and pocus, <laughs> right? Mr. Nekopax. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that would be a uninformed yet, uh, relatively educated suggestion at a guess, I guess. Okay, Mr. Nakofax to be followed by Ms. McElveen. Okay, this is, I, I think this is a very big undertaking for us. Um, I, I think there's great merit 
in aligning broadly committees to the strategic plan. That makes complete sense. Um, given the hard work that we've done to have a strategic focus and our committees need to be aligned with that. That said, when you start going down the road, that's I, I think that's going to be such a substantive conversation when you start going down the road, like Pat was saying, okay, what's not what's not required and where does that fit? And knowing the substantive work that these committees have done to just kind of randomly say, so SHAC, APAC, MSOAC, now they're in student success and we're going to, you know, we know how hard those committees have worked. We know what they are um, capable of and we know the reason they exist is because they, um, you know, they are special interest needs of the community and they require that representation um, because for, let's be real, for whatever reason, if they didn't have that representation, their voices might not be heard in the aggregate. So how then do we take, I guess, and if we're going to the governance route, how, you know, that's going to be governance's um, challenge to say, um, you know, so you could have broad committees, right, that, that are aligned to each of the goals and still have these subcommittees. I don't know. There's all kinds of different ways to do it. But I don't think we can dismantle um, some of those committees and just just say, okay, now we have four committees or whatever. Um, it, it's going to take some conversation. Governance can bring suggestions to us, and then I think we'll have lots of conversations. And I'm not sure we'll meet that deadline that you have. Okay. Mr. McElveen. just want to say the only two um, – committees that are required under Virginia code are ACSD and um, CTAC. Okay, any other board member prefer to go back? Adelia, a project. Um, my first comment is, is a question. I know that FESEP has, start, has to elect the representatives. I don't know if Title I is the same, if we can combine those or not. Or if, right, so I. I think I I'm going to have to ask Dr. Garza or Dr. Locker to look into that, whether they, okay. they are combinable, whether right. that's allowed, or we need to have them separately for funding reasons, grant, right. we get. Um, and then just uh, comment on, I, I know a total overhaul is complicated. Um, I also want to make sure that we're not doing something smaller just because it's easier. I. Um, I do think having served on some of the committees and seeing how some work differently and now being a representative or liaison to two, I think there's a way and a merit to having some, uh, we talked about SHAC, APAC, and MSAOC. I think finding a way where they can have individual voice but also more collaboration and combined voice will actually be a benefit that's tied to our goals, you know, kind of like in professional development and teaching, we always want it to be tied back to our practice and our goal. And if our practice is a strategic plan, um, I do think that there is merit to having um, more board members, community members, staff on each of the committees, however that will end up looking, um, so that the work is meaningful and thoughtful. I think a lot of the feedback I got from some of the unrequired committees is that it sometimes doesn't feel as meaningful and thoughtful um, and useful as it could be and useful people's times. So um, my leaning is toward finding a way where we can get to that point. Um, I don't know how we do that and how we do that, knowing that there is a history and a culture to some of the committees. Thank you. Who wanted to speak? Was that? OK. What's in the code? I stand corrected on the shack because there is a reference to code, um, but it's a may. May. It's it's a a shell. My understanding is only two are uh, legally required. And 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 Ms. Corbett Sanders says otherwise, okay. Oh, that's we have an option, not even have that. If you just go by the state curriculum rather than our own developed curriculum then we don't have to have a flea cap. And but we chose to have our own curriculum. In that case, we need to have a flea cap. 
That's and, my understanding of the requirement. And then fee FESEP is required by ESEA, and then mm. Title I is required as part of the district requirement. Right, I think that is why it's a separate required. Okay, we'll all look into that, make sure, give you right information, but my take for tonight is this. Let me first you know, address on option number two. Uh, on standing committees, I mean, we do have an audit committee with the committee members, that's the only one, but when you have the standing committees, a lot of decisions and recommendations made by those committees are eventually adopted by the full board for many good reasons. I'm not trying to discount the value of the committee members to serve, but, but we, are, we are elected by the voters and we are directly accountable to the voters for our votes on any of the decisions we make, not the community members. So I would hesitate including more community members to serve understanding committees. On advisory committees, on the other hand, their role is advising the board. If a school, if, if the board members feel that school board members should also join them on the advisory committees and work with the community members to come up with some recommendations in advisory nature. I mean, that's just something we can consider, but I would hesitate in putting community members on standing committees that has a much higher standing in the, in, the, in the eyes of everyone, including board members. That's my hesitation on that one. This obviously requires you know, a lot more of our time to be thoughtful in making our decisions on both the standing committees and advisory committees. If the, I, I know it's getting late, I mean, I am willing to, as a governance committee chair, to uh, take this to the governance committee and give some more thought and come back to a full board with uh, some more concrete, fleshed out ideas. And I would ask, request, you know, chairman, chairman of the board to uh, allow governance committee to have a plenty of time next time around, because I was gonna use uh, actually half a day at the retreat to talk about this, but that's been truncated to two hours and now truncated to one hour. So we obviously need more time for this. And we have to, we have to accordingly revise, have to, we'll probably have to revise the timeline. I mean, we have built in a little extra time in making decision by the end of June. And also on advisory committees, one of the things that we could potentially consider is, you know, not having to wait until the end of school year to receive these reports. All these committees do not really, I know, Mr. Press will not have a student representative to start serving from September through June, that time frame. But for rest of us, that's not, that shouldn't be always the case. You know, they could start from, you know, a couple of advisory committees could start from January to the next December. And they report to us in December time frame rather than June. Not everyone has to come at the same time because that puts us, when all these committees come to us at the same time, puts a lot of pressure upon board members on the workload. I know that because you know, we all have to read tons of tons of pages of report. And when you have all those you know, a, a reports, you cannot do as effective job as a board members to uh, give the kind of attention those reports and those committees deserve to have from board members. So that's just something we can consider, even having, rather than annual charge, we could have a biannual charge. It doesn't have to be exactly every year either. I know Mr. Press wants to have a student representative every year. But that's where I am, so if the board members will agree with me, I will take the whole thing to the governance committee. And we meet on Monday. And uh, Mr. Wilson and Mr. McElveen will be there along with Mrs. McLaughlin and have a little more discussion and report back to the full board. Is that okay? Hearing and seeing no objection, this work session is adjourned.